Hello and welcome to the Periphery from the Pulaski Institution. I'm Alan Elrod and our guest today is someone I'm really, really excited to talk to. It's uh, Professor Tom Nichols, uh, who you may know on Twitter as Radio Free Tom. Uh, he's Professor Emeritus at the U.S. Naval War College. He's a staff writer at The Atlantic, where you can read his Peacefield newsletter. And he is the author, most recently, of a book called Our Own Worst Enemy, which is now out in paperback, um, that focuses on the threat to democracy from within, the threat in which the way democracies, rich democracies, and particularly American society, have become uh, illiberal and dysfunctional uh, with regard to their politics. So thank you so much for being here, Tom. I'm really excited. Well, thanks. thanks for having me, Alan. Uh, I thought that the, the first place we could start is to actually have you lay out, I think, what is in many ways a centerpiece of your book and perhaps the most compelling, uh, at least for me, segment which is where you you deal with um, this study uh, in Italy by an academic named Banfield uh, uh, of this town in post-war Italy, uh, where there was a lot of social dysfunction and breakdown. And I thought I, you could lay that out uh, at the beginning for us, because I think it's a really good starting point for some of the things I want to I want to pick at w- with you. Yeah, Banfield's book, um, Edward Banfield was a really well-known academic and scholar back in the day. I mean, if you were my age and you went to grad school for sociology or political science or anthropology, I mean, you just read Banfield. He was a New Deal guy um, who left, uh, got disillusioned with the New Deal, left the FDR administration and um, decided to do research and teach at the University of Chicago. And what what really interested Banfield in that period, and this is like the late 40s, early 50s, is why can't people cooperate for their own good and create prosperity? And, you know, because, of course, this is all coming out of the Depression for a guy like Banfield. And he looked at some communities in places like Utah and Arizona and trying to figure out what makes what makes things work. He wasn't really interested in the question of democracy as much as he was interested in the in the problem of prosperity and, you know, kind of living standards. And so he he does some studies here in America and then his wife has to go to Italy to do some work and he goes along and they settle in this small town which he gives the the fake name Montegrano, because what he's about to write about them is kind of so insulting that he wanted to protect, um, you know, their name. This place in in kind of south south south, south, south central Italy uh, called Charamonte, and um, what Banfield figures out is that nobody thinks of the common good. It's all about you and your family. What's good for me and what's good for my family is good. And if it's not good for me and my family, screw you. Like there's no civic trust. There's no cooperation. He points out there's some of it's even a little heartbreaking. I mean, he points out that there's an orphanage in the city for little girls in this little village in Italy. Too much to call it a city. And this orphanage is, you know, run by nuns for little girls who and the buildings like falling down around their head. Nobody donates food. The, there's a whole bunch of um, workmen who are out of work in this period in Italy. They don't volunteer to fix up, you know, the walls or the nothing. I mean, it's like so, you know, they're not my kids. It's sort of like that line from It's a Wonderful Life, right? When Mr. Potter um, is talking about putting people out of their homes and Jimmy Stewart says, oh, these people have children, you know, and, and Potter says, well, they're not my children. And that was this town that, that um, nobody, tr- if the minute you got elected to anything, everybody jumped all over your case uh, for being corrupt and arrogant. Um, nobody bothered with any kind of civic associations other than some wealthy guys who kind of played cards together. And I, I'm going on at length about this because as I was trying to sketch out this book, I kept coming back to Banfield's book and saying, man, everything I find is just it's like a rerun of Italy in the early 1950s. Um, there's there's a line where one of the school teachers in town says, it's not, people are actively mistrustful of anyone who has knowledge or money. And I thought how, you know, in a time now, this populist phase in America where colleges are the enemy and education is bad. And I mean, this was, this really was, you know, um, 
a village full of kind of not very ambitious folks who made enough to get by, took care of their own kids. Um, there were two churches, nominally a Catholic country. Nobody went, um, you know, just on and on and on. And so there was so much of it that just I found is a really disturbing parallel. And what Banfield came to as a conclusion is the reason these people are poor or or that their village doesn't develop more is nobody cares enough to want to do it. They're all busy kind of bitching at each other and not getting along with each other and, you know, making sure that it's me, me, me first and, you know, no other um, um, energy devoted to civic affairs at all. And he contrasted this, I should say, um, in the book, he contrasted this old village in Italy with St. George, Utah. Now, you know, Banfield's kind of loading the dice here because, of course, Utah in the 50s, all Mormons. Very high civic association among people who are, you know, all the same religion and kind of have the same background. But he did make the point that that America in the 50s, that St. George wasn't that unique a place in America because you had the Red Cross, you had the Elks, you had the, you know, uh, the I don't know, I can't remember what other things there were in St. George. You know, the normal things you find in American town, the school committee, the fraternal organizations, the, you know, the the um, kind of layer of little institutions where people gather just to be with each other. And Monte Grano had none of that. And America had tons of that. And the problem is that since those days, over the past 70 years, we've we've regressed. We've gone backward. We don't go to those places. I mean, I should. it's not surprising to people with you know, my parents were members of the Elks. I'm a member of the Elks. I used to, I don't, I haven't been in a while, but I used to go and hang around at the Elks and do stuff. Um, you know, where I grew up, people were members of the Elks, the Moose, the Eastern Star, the this, the that. that that's all gone. And now we spend times in our homes with our screens. Um, and uh, the intermediate work here, and then I'll get off my, get off this podium um, this was something that about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, was cataloged by um, Robert Putnam at Harvard in a book called Bowling Alone. He raised the alarm on this 25 years ago. So it's not like I'm the first guy that ever had this thought. But Putnam called it Bowling Alone because he pointed out um, he, in the very best tradition of political science, right? He looked at something and said, huh, that's a kind of a weird thing. Like in the best tradition of science, really. He looked and he said, that's a weird thing. Why is that happening? And the weird thing was, why aren't people joining bowling leagues anymore? America used to be full of bowling leagues. Even if you watch The Simpsons, right, there's a running gag about the bowling league and, the and you know, the, the team. Um, and the reason is people don't want to associate with each other. They bowl alone. And so I thought that it was good way to set up the discussion of the decline of democracy around the world, particularly in the developed world, by pointing out that, you know, these problems aren't new. This little Italian village in 1954 was just as, you know, had the same problems. Um, but here, here we are again, right back to the start. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that, I mean, appreciate that really great summation of that segment of the book, and it's it's such a compelling part of the book. I want to throw a specific kind of policy issue space at you and a kind of specific person. I know that the, both the Banfield study and really your book are kind of really about these sort of bottom-up analysis of, of the problem. But I kind of want to throw an example using this sort of elite figure at you, partly because I knew we were going to be chatting but I, when I watched the State of the Union response, which I'm an Arkansan, so I watched Joe Biden, and then I watched my newly elected governor deliver the Republican response. Uh, she opened with the story about her own cancer survival and then talked about the uh, – I don't know if you saw that, by the way. I did. I did. I watched it. She opened the story about her cancer survival, talked about the quality of care she got, and then talked about you know, Democrats want to ruin all of that, et cetera. And what I couldn't shake was... And, and then told a long story, by the way, right. about traveling with the former president, whom she would not oh, name, yeah. and then went to some military thing where somebody, you know, with tears in his eyes, it was all it was all very me, me, me kind exactly. of stuff. It was very weird. But the medical thing was really interesting to me because what I couldn't shake was, this is so frustrating to me, 
because you're giving this talk about how cancer has deeply affected your family as a response to a president about whom that's one of the main things people know about him is that he cares deeply. About, and it was it could have been a moment where before going into all the ways that the parties disagree, she could have said, Joe Biden and I both know that cancer is terrible. Now, here's why I think that, you know, I have whatever better ideas about it. She didn't do that. She actually used the fact that they share this horrible experience with the disease to dehumanize him. And then yeah. she also, and people have noted this, she talks about the quality of care she got in a state that generally has terrible health care. You know, there is really, really high quality medical care available to you in Arkansas if you live in a couple places and you have resources. And if you live outside of those places and you don't have resources, we have some of the worst mortality rates in the country. And it's kind of stunning to have your governor say, well, look at the quality of care. I was like, you know, I, I think what's interesting to me about that and healthcare feels like such a great place to talk about this, because a lot of times when people bring up healthcare, the attitude is my healthcare works great, so we shouldn't change it, which is an infuriating way to have the conversation, right? Whether or not you think more privatized or more socialized methods are the best way to get to the way we want it to be. When the argument starts with, well, my healthcare is good. It's infuriating, right? And it gets at that what you're you're talking about, I think. It's a really good example of a policy space where so much of the conversation is dominated by, well, this works for me. My family went through this and we got ours. Or I don't have to worry. We got ours. So why change it? Mm -hmm. Well, I think watching that response from Governor uh, Sanders, a couple of things occurred to me. One is I think she told the cancer story in part to try to humanize herself. Because... In the, after her time in the Trump administration, she, like a lot of other people who work for Trump, kind of became cartoons. They kind of just became, you know, there was just a ridiculousness about them. Um, I mean, you know, people, what people, a lot of other before tonight, you know, when I think of Sarah Sanders, Huckabee Sanders, I think of her under oath saying, yeah, I lied from the podium. Everybody does. You know, that's uh, of course I told lies. So she starts with this thing saying, I know you think I'm this, you know, evil witch. Um, But I actually am a cancer survivor, and therefore I'm human, and I'm just like you. And that's become a thing in our politics, right? That instead of saying, look, my fellow, we uh, presidents used to begin, my fellow Americans, my fellow citizens. Now it's, yeah, screw that. Um, Look, think about me as a cancer survivor. Think about me as, and look, I'll say that Joe Biden doesn't say, like, my son lost a son. You know, he served in Iraq. The whole, I mean, we try too hard to um, connect on this personal level as a way of kind of stirring emotion when we should be able to have conversations as citizens about stuff that doesn't directly involve us and that we can talk about what's good for our community, you know? Um, and, but instead it's gotta be, we always have to personalize things with, let me tell you about something that happened to me. Um <clears throat> I think the other thing that really struck me about that response is that it was entirely an appeal to fear. There was no sense of, you know, here are the thing. here's how we could do better. It was merely a litany of these are bad people that are coming to make you do things that you don't want to do. And I, I thought there was a lot of projection in there. They're going to make you worship their, you know, idols and salute their flag. And I thought, You know, I thought back to January 6th, where people were just waving flags with this with a man's name on it, which I thought was kind of creepy. Um, But it but this is the you know, this is the new tribalism of America, which is you have to identify with me and you have to be on my side. And you can't possibly think of anyone else as a human being. um, Because they're just your enemies. Now, this was not um, to, to go back to, you know, our Italian village example. It wasn't. It didn't reach that level of hostility, but there were there were things of you know um, when the war was over, nobody wanted to talk about who was a fascist, who was a communist, who was a socialist, who was a Christian Democrat. You know, they just sort of said, okay, um, you know, this this these were people who had just been through a terrible war, and they just wanted to ignore everybody else. This is different. This is a I think to you know. It's interesting you brought up Sanders because unlike the people who are saying, well, I just, 
you know, I'm not interested in politics. I don't want to think about this stuff. These are, these people are like rage entrepreneurs. They make their careers on making sure that other people are angry enough to vote. And there's no, there's nothing constructive about it. And I say this, people listening may not realize this, but I was a Republican for almost 35 years. And I partly I left over this kind of sour, bitter, dark, you know, imagery, because when I joined the Republican Party, you know, the first presidential election I voted in was 1980. It was the optimistic can do. You know, I'm not saying you have to agree with everything the Republicans believed in or, you know, what Ronald Reagan was running on in 1980. But it was a very kind of can do solution oriented, optimistic conservatism. And now I think all you're left with is other people are bad. Other people want to hurt you. Um, they're not really your fellow citizens. Um, they are the enemy. And and therefore, you must vote for me because otherwise I am the only person that can stop them from, you know, hurting your family and destroying your life. And that you can't sustain a democracy on that. That can't last. I, I mean, I connect with all of that. I'm going to out my father, who's uh, an, a, a well-known at this point, Arkansas Democrat. Uh, his his very first presidential election was was set, was 76 and he voted for Ford. Uh, um, you, and, well, and, you know, Gerald Ford uh, was a good guy. Yeah. I mean, but 76 know. is an enviable election, right? Two good men, right? Like, right. Well, you know, good. and I tell this story in the book, my hopeful, uh, the one thing I don't want people to think that I don't think there's any hope, but my father um, died in his 90s, just before the 2012 election. And my dad was an old school Democrat turned Republican, classic, you know, Nixon voter in 68, the Republican, the Democrats have all turned into a bunch of, you know, draft dodging, acid dropping, commie wimps, you know. Um, <clears throat> and frankly, my dad, born in 1918, was a racist. He, he didn't like he didn't like black people. People didn't like there are a whole bunch of people he didn't like in the world. And yet, as he was watching, um, we were watching the coverage of the election um, 2012. And I said, well, because we were both from Massachusetts and happened to like Mitt Romney. And I said, I don't think I don't think Romney's got a chance against, you know, this, this very popular president. And my father, out of nowhere, said, they're both good men. We're going to be fine. Now, if my dad at 90 something years old after you know a lifetime of uh you know not the most enlightened racial attitudes and voting you know as we both did you know voting pretty hard to the right he just looked and he said we're going to be fine these these are good men both of them we don't think that way anymore i mean people are demon trying to demonize joe biden you know who has been around american politics for 50 years every democrat in public life knows the guy and most of them like him. You know, I mean, this is just this is how insane we've become that we, you know, we think that every president who's going to win, you know, anybody who's anybody who wins is the devil. And it's the end of civilization as we know it. And uh, so I guess I didn't mean to interrupt, but that's a great election example in 1976. of you're looking at Jimmy Carter, Gerald Ford, and you're saying, I remember that. I was 15 at the time. I wasn't old enough to vote. I was watching that election. I was saying. Yeah, all right. These both seem like, you know, decent human beings. I mean, this we're not going to, you know, fall off a cliff if one of these guys is elected. And I think we need to get back to that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll out myself in a somewhat, uh, maybe even self-deprecating way as someone for whom Jimmy Carter is their favorite president, uh, despite his fault. Okay, let's, I have to draw some lines <laughs> somewhere. Let's, let's not get crazy. Um, uh, but, but, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I had a similar, you know, before I could actually vote, I remember the first election I could really pay attention to, I, I was, um, or that I kind of remember in 2000 being really bothered by what I thought, what I was hearing about the treatment of McCain in the primaries. Cause I, I wasn't old enough to know politics, especially well, or have a politics, but I was like, this seems like a good person. He seems like he's being treated very poorly in a way that felt kind of disgraceful to me. Um, but the references to Reagan and, and Ford, these are questions I wanted to get into. And so now I'm just going to go to them, which is a lot of what we're talking about is domestic, but I'm really interested in, you know, 
you're a foreign policy guy, so so let's go to foreign policy. And what also really concerns me, which is this total deterioration of of um, a sense of what American foreign policy is about and what it's for. Um, and, and what I have seen and that that is interesting to me is um, not just a kind of black hole, like a sort of we're not people who aren't for things, but a, but a but a certain kind of uh, advocacy for a world of of uh, international politics that I think would have very much troubled uh, Reagan or 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 and I mean Carter's still alive so he is troubled by it but uh, this idea and I wrote this when the when the um, Russian invasion first happened you had people like JD Vance and, and others going on and saying I don't care or even saying I'm for Russia which is that. That kind of some of that narcissism and chivism that you talk about at the domestic level, the way it sometimes to me seems to manifest internationally is a kind of politics where what these people want is an international order defined by arch nationalism, defined by. I don't even think it's. No, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no. You're, you're, def- I, def- I don't even think it's that. that kind of, I don't think means, it's that well developed. Right. I right. think it's it's almost like toddlers saying whatever. It, whatever the Democratic Party is doing, whatever Joe Biden's doing is bad um, mm. because the one of the ways you know this and and there was just a poll came out, I think it was Gallup a couple of days ago. There is still a broad bipartisan consensus among American citizens about supporting Ukraine. The people that are making noises about it are the people with a very narrow audience like Tucker Carlson or J.D. Vance or you know, um, uh, trying to think of who else kind of came out about this the other day in a kind of dumb way. But that's playing to Tucker Carlson is playing to his audience and Vance and others are playing to their primary voters. They, They don't care that there's a lot of ordinary Republican voters out there who disagree with them, Um, because if you're, you know, J.D. Vance or Lee Stefanik or um, you know, um, Jim Jordan or whoever, all you have to do is survive your primary mm. because then you're running in safe districts. And and this is true of Democrats as well. That's why, you know, um, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez can talk about socialism and the Green New Deal and all that because it doesn't matter. As long as she defeats whoever's running in the primary, she's in a D plus 55 district. And the same thing for guys like, you know, Jordan and, and, um, you know, he's gotten up Gomer and Green. I mean, they Green, you know, Green comes from like a, a an R plus 22 district. Mm-hmm. You know, she, she literally can do no wrong if she survives her primary. Right. So she's going after these very kind of she's going after the guys who went to Trump rallies wearing T-shirts that said, I'd rather be a Russian than a Democrat. But my point, and I'm trying to be optimistic here, is the vast majority of Americans, Republicans and Democrats alike, understand that this is an important thing to do. And I think the reason that we first, you know, I I will say under no circumstances do you ever have to hand it to Putin. (laughs) Right. Right. Um, But Putin recharged the American and and Western and democratic sense of purpose, because he reminded us what real enemies of democracy look like. I think for 30 years without a Cold War, without a Soviet Union, it was easy to shoot your mouth off and be unserious and be irresponsible and say, oh, I'd rather be a Russian, because you didn't know what that meant. Because it's a stupid, frankly, it's a stupid comment that that says that you've never set foot in Russia. Mm -hmm. I, I, I spent my life studying Russia. I Spent, I went to the Soviet Union four times before it collapsed. When people say, well, what's the big deal? You know, I, there are times I just want to send people and throw a time machine to, you know, 1983 and say, go do that for a summer and come back like I did and see how you feel about it. But because that's long in the mists of memory, people say, oh, what's a big deal? And, you know, who cares? And because there are no consequences, there's no there's no alternative out there. Even China, when people talk about China, they think about it in primarily in terms of they're eating our lunch economically. But they, mm-hmm. you know, every image we see of China in TV and movies is, you know, 
um, Batman jumping off of towers in Shanghai and big glittering cities and Mission Impossible and, you know, 007 in Hong Kong. And, you know, we don't we don't realize that China has to main the reason China has to maintain maintain seven, eight, nine percent growth is because they still haven't built enough roads and toilets for everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, I, income inequality in China and Russia is higher than it is here. And people just don't get it. And they don't connect. And, I, and I, I'll, again, I'll stop ranting. They don't connect their own behavior to this. They don't understand that, um, you know, Russia gets by by selling oil and China gets by by selling cheap electronics and other products to us. People say, how come China is eating our lunch? Well, because you have three televisions in your house. That's why. Right. Um, and so there's no sense of seriousness or purpose in any of this. And I think Putin, I think that's changed over the past year. I think Putin, if you'd have told me 30 years ago that NATO would be 32 countries, including Finland and Sweden, I would have said that you're totally high. But I also would never have expected Vladimir Putin to try to invade. And so I, I, I will, let me just admit to a, a big professional mistake I made once I was, um, I think I was in Poland. It was about 25 years ago or so. And I said, look, what, you know, why are we, what's the big deal? It's not like the Russians are going to try and roll over 45 million Ukrainians on their way to NATO. You know, like they don't, they couldn't even, and of course that 25 years later, that's exactly what happened. But I will say that I was right in my prediction that the Russians couldn't possibly do it either. Um, But here we are. And now we've rediscovered why we have NATO and why we have a Western alliance and why democracy is important. I mean, I, I'll share quickly before I ask you some more questions, an anecdote along the same lines of when I, in 2013, I was in grad school studying nationalism and I went to DC and visited a friend who worked for the State Department and we were walking and we walked past the Russian embassy and she kind of just looked over and said, there is something along the lines of, you know, I don't trust those people. And I said, you know, kind of jokingly, okay, cool it, cool it, Reagan. Right. And I now I tell yeah. her all the time how wrong I was. Right. Like I'm like, I, you know, I, because then I'm sitting there in the spring of 2014 in an, in an IR grad class. While, you know, Russian green men, right, are are popping up in Crimea. And, you know, there it is, right? And I, I think I even texted her like that day, like, well, no. But I will say, you know, look, in the, you among, know, the Russia, right? <laughs> among, among the Russia guys, we do have something of a debate on kind of um, in the background about those of those few of us who are, I mean, it's easy to be a pessimist, right? Because you say, mm-hmm. well, everything's going to be bad then you're rarely ever proven wrong because you don't have to talk about how bad it's going to be. You just say, well, I don't, I think things could, well, God rest his soul. Michael Handel, one of my late colleagues, great man. He'd say, uh, he had this, this very strong Austrian, Australian accent. He sounded like he walked out of a movie, you know, and he'd say, whenever I'm asked about the Middle East, I say next year will be violent and complex in the Middle East. And I am never wrong, you know, and, and uh, so, you know, pessimism is the easy call. But for those of us who were optimistic in the early 1990s, and I, I held on to my optimism to up to about 2006, um, the question is, was Putin always like this or did Putin change? Did something change in Russia? Um, because remember, the Putin that we were dealing with in 2005, 6, 7 was saying things like, no one should, de- you know, we're never going to invade Ukraine. No one to try and determine the fates of other countries. You know, Mm -hmm. no one wants the Soviet Union back. Um, My colleague, Ann Applebaum, has a theory that um, COVID was a big part of this, that he he was kind of isolated in a bunker for a year and a half with nothing but these, you know, right-wing priests and nationalists advising a very small circle of people. So, you know, I think we could give ourselves a little bit of a break. It was very hard in 2000 or 2001 to see the biggest war in Europe since Nazi Germany invaded. Um, and, you know, the, uh, but again, it, it has reignited a sense of purpose. I mean, if you had told me, again, not just about NATO, but the European Union and, you know, this kind of reestablishment of American leadership and the West, and not just the West, I, I think the democracies, uh, you know, Australia, Japan, others, um, really reacting to this in in unison. Um, I don't think you've seen this kind of unity in the Western world since maybe 
you know, to, to invoke Reagan here since maybe sometime in the mid 1980s. Yeah. Um, so because all, you, all, have, all thanks to Vladimir Putin, all, which is yeah. really ironic. I Incredible. Think. Uh, so because you've got, I know you've got to, um, a heart, uh, I'd love, I've got two, two kind of big questions I want to ask you to have you kind of wrestle with, uh, both of which I think link what we're about at Pulaski to the themes in your book and, and, and what we've been talking about right now, which is one is flipping from the military security side of, of international relations to the economic. You do a really good job in your book of setting aside, setting up the kind of broad conversation around globalization and the quote unquote left behind areas of, Arguments on the one side, like uh, Fiona Hill and Ian Bremmer saying, uh, this is a real problem. People have legitimate grievances. It has globalization has ravaged some of these places. We, we got to deal with that. Um, some of the arguments on the other side of, of like Kevin Williamson, which is kind of essentially, look, 200 years ago, some of these towns weren't here. So what's, you know, if in 50 years, they're also not here, that's changed. That's history. That's how things go, right? Kevin Williamson, we just met, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Like your town is set up to be a mill town in the 1840s, and it, then it's not anymore, and that happens. Somewhere kind of in between that, I think, is where we reside at Pulaski, because a lot of what we take is globalization is good. Globalization, global interconnectivity, trade, uh, increased cooperation, increased interdependence, these are good things. But th- there is something resonant for a lot of people, and you get at this in, in your book, I think, in a really compelling way, which is in many ways, it's perception more than reality, but there is something resonant for a lot of people in what they feel is the placelessness of this, these processes. And that our kind of proposition is that globalization is good, but before it to be not just economically sustainable, but politically sustainable, to, to withstand these kinds of waves of reactionary and populist pushback, you have to find a way to integrate place into these processes in a way that not just allows the benefits to reach more people, but allows people to feel participatory in them. And that's kind of the argument we try to make. And I'm curious about how you wrestle with that. You know, in some ways, the famous what Theresa May's speech in Florence about Brexit, where she talks about people from nowhere, um, is really perfectly emblematic of this challenge. Well, let me let me point out a couple of things. First of all, I come from one of those places. Um, <clears throat> I I you know I think. For people listening who don't know me, um, I grew up in a in a factory town. My parents were both high school dropouts. Um, you know, I did not come from a, you know, I didn't grow up in some Tony suburb of Boston and then, you know, go to Yale and where I wore big sweaters and sang the Whiff and Poof song. You know, I mean, I, you know, I, I, my parents did not finish high school. I was first to college. I worked my way through school, all that stuff. And a couple of things I want to say about globalization and industrial decline. First of all, again, beware of the rage entrepreneurs who say, oh, my God, this has never had. Look at this, you know, American carnage, like, you know, this carnage. I'm sorry, but those factories where I live closed down in the 70s. By the time, um, you know, globalization as we know it came along, my hometown was already devastated by the collapse of things like, you know, textile industries and sheet metal manufacture and all that other stuff that was just cheaper to do elsewhere. And let us never forget that part of what drove all this is that people wanted cheaper stuff. You know, I'm sorry. I, I've been told people get mad when I say this and they say I'm blaming the victim. But, you know, in one the biggest employer in my hometown and my first job in politics As a summer intern, because we were so shorthanded in my small town, I was actually part of the plant closing task force. My my local mayor just said, you know, we're losing this big factory. Come to the meetings with us. See what you can learn, you know. Um, And the plant was a tire factory. And why was the tire factory closing? Because nobody wanted American cars with single ply tires. It was 1979, 1980. The audio industry was in the dumper. There was no way that any company was going to invest in a 100-year-old, decrepit, outdated tire plant in the frost belt of New England. It wasn't going to happen. And I had to give unemployment forms to middle-aged men and counsel them on how to get fill out all these this paperwork 
you know, because I, hey, I was in college. I was supposed to be the smart kid, you know, and I was helping these poor guys. And it was heartbreaking. But there was like, why is the factory closing? And I kept thinking, because there was, because there's no alternative to it. There's no way. And I think one thing people ought to understand about globalization, it's not a choice. It's like trying to be mad at the weather. Globalization was inevitable. It was going to happen no matter what. From the time, from the moment we figured out how to get container ships across the ocean and cheaply move stuff across vast distances of the earth, which the first, um, and this is a great little trivia question, first big container ship, I think it's like 1966. So we can't really do that until the late 60s. At that point, America's edge in the post-war manufacturing world, right? Everybody's recovering from World War II. Things are moving around the world. The idea that you could avert globalization was um, just magical thinking. Now, bad, there were, you know, did bad policy think? Sure, we could have, we should have, invested a lot sooner in things like job retraining and, you know, frankly, in helping people move. You know, Ronald Reagan in this, um, in, in Michael Moore's only good movie, in my opinion, Roger and Me, where he, he dogs the head of GM for lying about closing factories. But th there's a shot of Reagan talking to out of work auto workers. And they're like, what do you think we ought to do? And he's like, well, uh, move. You know, and this is something else Americans just have to. And I'm coming around. I didn't the know you had that Reagan back. in your back pocket. That was a decent Reagan. <laughs> I've got a pretty well. Well, thank you, Alan. Uh, Nancy and I have always been admirers of yours too. Um, but um, I'm coming around the back door here to your point about place. Somewhere in their lives, Americans decide that you should never have to go anywhere to. When I graduated from high school in 1979, there were, I remember guys just said, I remember a couple of guys I was talking to said, what are you guys going to do after high? I'm going off to college, you know, take my shot. And they said, yep, we're, we're, my buddy and I are loading up the truck. We're going to Texas. We're going to look for some construction jobs. Another one of my friends went out to Nevada, became a contractor and is now a millionaire, you know, gazillionaire. I mean, there was a time where you just said, look, I, it's not, um, you know, it's not a normal thing to just say, I'm, I'm going to stay right here and do what my dad did. Um, and cause there were guys that did that in my hometown. I'm going to, they're going to, there was a drop forge. I'm going to take you down to more. I'm going to get you a union card and you're going to just do the thing that I did for 40 years and probably live in the same apartment. But that, that wasn't sustainable. That wasn't going to last. So the question is, how do you take all of this change? Um, and, and, you know, turn it to the advantage of the greatest number of people in society. And I'm going to, now I'm going to change up on you, Alan, and say, that's not the problem with democracy. The poorest people in America, the people most hurt by this stuff are actually not the people rebelling against democracy. The people that showed up for things like January 6th and who are voting for some of the most extreme candidates are actually middle class employed people. And that's the, that's why I, I mean, I, I felt I owed you an honest answer about globalization, which I think right. has benefits and drawbacks. And, you know, there wasn't much we could do about it no matter what. But I think what's really bothersome to me in this whole conversation every time I have it and I talk about it in the book is that, but that's not what drove all this anti democratic behavior. It's, it's the middle class who feel like their status is not appropriately represented. The thing um, I think it's about, people, it's, it's middle class white people who don't right. like demographic change in places like Britain. It's middle class guys or working middle to working class guys who somehow think just as Americans do and Italians do that my kids moved off to the city and they don't, you know, they don't want to be back here with me in, you know, this little hamlet and on and on and on. And I think we have to get it out of our heads that somehow I mean, I, I say this in the book, right? I mean, I, you know, mm -hmm. Ian Bremmer and I are old friends. You know, I think he's one of the smartest guys I know, but I think Ian's wrong mm -hmm. when he talks about the forgotten places. I think Fiona Hill is just wrong about this, even though I think her description of it is quite right. I wonder if this could, could, 
could toggle the two, which is there's a line I think about. I thought about it when I read your book a lot, which is in David Michaud's like The King, right? Which is his his film version essentially of Henry V. And he's he's having Falstaff talk to um Chalamet's character, Prince Harry at the time, he says, you know, talking about the people feeling slighted by France and urging to war. And at a certain point, he says the line, he says, right, the people, what the people believe, right, essentially may, may be a fantasy. And then he says, but that does not mean that it is not felt true. And that, to me, gets at the core of what's so challenging about this, right? Even the aspects of it that may be fantastical, perception, it's still such a potent thing. Okay, but then I, I have to stop you here and say, but but what is the role of political leadership? Is it to turn right. to people and right. say, okay, this thing you believe isn't true, but I'm going to act as if it is because you're the boss and you're right. always right. That's irresponsible. Um, it's I think that's an abdication of leadership. You know, when I uh, uh, let me tell an I'll tell one anecdote and then link it to a larger statistical reality. One of the things that stuck in my head as I was writing this book. It was a good friend of mine that I'd grown up with from like second grade, right? I mean, I've known this guy. He since passed away. God rest his soul. He's a good man. But he also was one of these angry white voters. Um, he had had a he was a smart guy, but he also had some, you know, run ins with the law and wasn't the most responsible guy in the world. And yet. In his 50s, had a house, two kids that had gone to school, a steady job and a boat. Mm. Uh, that he just would go out on the Connecticut River and hang on his boat. And he was, he sat there saying to me, Tom, you know, it's just, I voted, I voted for change. I, things got to change. And I exploded at him. I said, you did better than this country did better by you than you had a right to. I said, I've known you since we were children. And I said, you got away with murder at, to get, I said, when did it occur to you that your life was bad when you were on your boat? And he and he laughed. Of course, you know, these are the things that you can say to an old friend right. that you used to break windows with. And, you know, I wasn't the nicest kid either. You know, we ran and did a lot of. Well, anyway, my daughter may be yeah. listening, to this, so I'm not <laughs> going to talk about all the rotten things I did as a teenager. But but, you know, I said, you're just wrong about this. I right. said, you're just I said, I said, and I and that and I said, what is it you want? And he said, well, you just don't understand. I said, no, you tell me. I said, you know, in 2016, you ran the board. You got everything you wanted. Now tell me what, what you're supposed to do. And what he really wanted, and I said this to him point blank, I said, you want it to be 1966, and you want us to be walking down the main street of our town and getting a, a you know, going to the diner and getting bubblegum cards and yeah. not have it full of and not have it full of Spanish churches. You know, and and um, you know, crime and all. He said, "Yeah, pretty much." I said, "Well, I'm sorry, but that's not how any of it works." So let me just link this down to the statistical part, which is that in every survey of happiness, it is a infuriatingly American thing to say, "I am generally happy with the quality of my life." And by the way, we find this from people making less than forty thousand dollars all the way up to people making, you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. Most people say, I am generally happy with my life and my family, and I'm generally content. Then ask them, how do you think things are going in the country? And they say, oh, screwed. It's horrible. Horrible. Country's in horrible shape. Even though every year that they're asked this, they say, I'm fine. It's the other. And I think this is just the internalization of a lot of negative messages. And I think that we really need political leaders who will step forward and say, uh, I realize it's probably a family-oriented um, podcast, so I won't swear. Yeah, but I say, cut the, sh you know, <laughs> cut the crap. You're, you know, this isn't true. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when it's if you're, I, I mean, it's one thing to say, look, I can't afford my insulin. Okay, well, then vote for the people that are going to lower the cost of your insulin. But instead, it's there's a there's a book, and I'll just finish with this part. By, by noting this book by Jonathan Metzl, which I'm sure you're aware of called Dying of Whiteness. Yeah. Where Metzl talks to a lot of people, not in Arkansas, but in parts of the deep South where he says, where they literally say, yes, I need a new liver. Yes, I need medical care. But if voting for that socialist nonsense means that I get medical care and the, the, you know, the Mexican guy down the street or the black guy, then I don't want it. I would rather die. 
And people literally have rather died than simply to say, yeah, you know, we have to have these programs. And at, at some point I find myself, I, I guess, what am I trying to say? I feel like I'm running. I feel like this is a really bad thing. I feel like I'm running out of empathy. Mm. Cause when somebody says, well, if other people get that benefit, um, I don't care if it'll keep me alive. I don't want it. Well then, okay. Then I'm, you know, then I don't, then as I said to my friend whom I loved dearly, what do you want other than to try and turn the clock back to 1966? What is it you want? And I've never, most of the people I've ever asked that question of, they say, well, I don't want, you know, and then they give this, this kind of Sarah Sanders answer, you know, well, I don't want, I don't want trans kids peeing in cat litter, you know, or furries peeing in cat litter and drag queens, you know, running loose in the street. It's like, that's not really a policy. That's just a kind of a pissy. I mean, you know, I, I live here in big, you know, in the Northeast, I, I spend my time in places like Boston. I can't remember the last time I encountered a drag queen anywhere. Right. Um, You know, but this is what passes now. When it, when, what it really means is I want you to pay attention to me. I want you to respect me. I want the status I think I deserve. Um, and that, as you know, you read the book for people listening. I think the strongest political force there is right now is gen, kind of a general resentment against other people because you somehow think they're better than you or think they're better than you or they're looking down on you. And we would be a better country if most people took stock of their lives and said, am I basically happy? Are my kids OK? Mm-hmm. You know, instead of saying, um, you know, what are the drag queens in San Francisco doing? You know, if you don't like what's going on in San Francisco, don't live there. <laughs> I, I say that a lot to friends. I'm like, when was the last time you were in? There? But I want you, I, I want you, I think. Oh, if, you, I'm, I'm sorry. You just pinged something in my head, Alan. You oh, know, when you talk about, uh, it's such a great, when they say, well, we have to go out and, you know, go out to these small towns and the diners and, you know, the pe And I'm like, how about if we do it the other way? I want to take busloads of people and I'll take them for a walking, t- a walking uh, th- tour of the city of Boston and get to meet people in a big mm. city and find out that they're not aliens because yeah. a lot of these folks say, well, you look down on us. And I have answered, I've done this, you know, when I've been right. speaking and I say, and you look down on them too. They do. They do. This they do. goes both ways. It does. And JD Vance, the one time he was really honest about it, talked about a kind of reverse rural snobbery, uh-huh. um, you know, where suddenly you're a bad person if you got it. I have a friend who comes from a very humble background. He got a scholarship to MIT and half his family stopped talking to him like, yeah. just yeah. because of that. So I don't know how you deal with that. My family did not stop speaking, but I, you know, I had family members who were totally uninterested when I got into grad school at NYU in visiting New York, um, specifically just because of that kind of hostility. Uh, real quick, I think for fun, I want you to take all this because you do such a good job of 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 chopping up nostalgia in the book and so much of what you just described you want it to be 1966 right and everybody kind of loves their childhood era so i want you to load up that uh that uh your your uh your 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 cranky shotgun double barrel at me as i say as a child of the 90s i'm gonna i'm gonna lay out why the 90s were the best time in the world and you just eviscerate me uh you know in the 90s uh the economy was booming i had as much sugar as i wanted in my cereal the Arkansas Razorbacks have one of the best basketball programs in the country. M- m- our boy, Bill, for those of us down here in Arkansas, was president of the United States. Uh, there was great, you know, Seinfeld and Friends were on television. There wasn't all this PC stuff telling me what I couldn't do. Uh, you know, people still, you know, people could take a joke, but they went to church on Sunday. And you know what? When America went to war, we were bombing Serbs in Kosovo for trying to commit genocide. The 90s are the best time in the entire world. And, you know, I'm not gonna, if we could just go I, back you know, the, to the 90s. Everything <laughs> would be better. Uh, and, and we'd be happier people. Hey, the 90s weren't so bad. <laughs> no, I was in my 30s in the yeah. 1990s. And they, you know, I'm. Uh, it was I, I, I would say that the big the big change in American life um, where things really improve, I would say, comes in the late 80s to the early 1990s. Um, you know, I mean, I don't, I, I mean, I think that's when the power of personal computing takes off. But yes, for a lot of people, the 90s are terrible because it means the end of a lot of, you know, particularly in middle management, not in working class jobs. The, the people that really got hurt in the 90s were 
kind of people with high school or some college who had these kind of managerial jobs that just got cut by things like automation and data processing. Think about the jobs <clears throat> that you didn't need to do anymore, like data entry or even things like grocery clerk, right? Because we have scanners now and things like that. So let me let me be really cranky about the people who say to me, oh, you grew up in the 60s? I was born in 1960, so I graduated high school in 1979. Oh, you grew up in those days? That must have been awesome. Do you know what I remember? My wife and I are the exact same age. We always laugh about this. You know what I remember about the 1960s? Sweating. Because nothing was air conditioned. And you tossed and turned. You, t- today, people just expect, well, of course, everything's air conditioned. I mean, your offices are air conditioned. Your schools are air conditioned. I mean, we used to roast through everything. Thing because air conditioning was a luxury for rich people. Cars routinely broke down and stranded you. I used to drive with a bottle of antifreeze and a quart of oil in my trunk, just in case. Um, you know, the things, this notion that somehow things were just awesome in the 60s and 70s, people smoked in pipes, <laughs> had ashtrays in them because you could smoke while you were waiting to do your banking indoors. But let me make a more serious point. It was also a time where if you were a woman, you wanted a car, your husband had signed for the loan. You didn't have your own credit card. If you were black, this was still within living memory. Despite the Civil Rights Act, um, there was still a, you know, son, that this this part, you know, the neighborhood isn't for you. Your part's over there. This bar isn't for you. Mm-hmm. You're the bar down the street. Um, that, you know, we didn't, it wasn't as, you know, back to water fountains, but it was close. So this notion that, you know, you know why we loved it in 1966? Because we were five and Batman was on. Yep. And, and we romanticize it and idealize it. Um, but I wouldn't go back to the 60s and especially not the 70s. <laughs> Where, well, you know, look, I mean, all kidding aside, people talking about gas prices are so high. Really? I remember sitting in line every other day, every with, you know, on odd and even days for gas because of the embargo, because, you know, you literally couldn't buy gas. Um, You know, we had these really terrifying things happen. We were living through the Cold War. People were getting drafted. That's the other thing. Oh, the 60s. Yeah, it was great if you weren't being drafted. (laughs) <laughs> and sent to Vietnam, where you know fifty five thousand, uh, fifty seven thousand Americans died. Um, you know, the, I think we just we we get this sense because I think we don't know how to cope with prosperity, mm-hmm. and I think we don't understand it. There's a thing I talk about in the book called hedonic adaptation, which is a fancy way of saying that once you get used to a certain standard of living, you think that everything else sucks. Um, you know, like I noticed this, right. All my life, I grew up, um, I lived in a small house with my parents in a working class neighborhood. I had a, I had a twin bed, right. I had a single bed growing up. The first time I bought a full size bed, I thought I was sleeping in a football field. And then after a while, you're like, you know, queen size bed's nice too, you know, and, and you just kind of get used to it. And I think people don't realize the things that, I mean, I, You were talking about when you were in graduate school, Alan. When I was in graduate school, it was the mid 1980s, Um, and I, I to describe how I lived as a student in the 80s to my students now. I just retired from teaching and at both the War College and at um, the Harvard Extension School, and you know, it's it's almost like describing something that for them is medieval. Yeah, a typewriter. You know, this is what it, this is a typewriter, kids. It took, you know, ink and paper and you had to, I mean, it's just, and I think we, we, we get, I mean, I think of things like cars. You, one way Americans used to tell status is that, um, you looked at what kind of car people drove and poor people drove crappy rambling cars and well off people drove really nice cars. And I, um, just bought a really nice car, my kind of retirement car. I spent a little extra money on a pretty nice high end car, but I have to tell you the difference in what it can do between this and the Honda Accord that I drove for 10 years is almost, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, they both perform well. They both have a lot of technology in them. And it really comes down to, you know, things like trim level back in the day, 
it was the difference between a car that literally broke down and could you know get you get you fired from your job and a car that was you know a Cadillac um and i think people just don't understand that that the gap let me phrase this properly so that i don't make people um freak out about statistics there is a there is definitely a gap in income in america that has grown the income the wage gap right the income gap people rich people are getting richer the, the middle class has only done slightly better the work the working class you know kind of stagnated but the difference in living standards is actually much smaller than it used to be if that makes sense to you like the difference between a rich guy's car and a poor man's car the difference between a rich guy's tv and a poor man's tv you know i mean this is something that just strikes me all the time we had a we i only knew one really well off family when i grew up and they lived really differently than we did um you know whereas today you know rich poor most people have air conditioning televisions computers smartphones um and that makes a difference I, and there's a there's a passage in the book that if anybody's actually thinking of reading the book I'll recommend to them where a, um an economist talk a guy named uh, uh, Boudro talks about if he could go back to 19 if he could take his family from 19 the 1970s and give them everything that they that he has now as a kind of middle class guy they would think that they were in this amazing wonderland and i think people forget that because they either are too young to have experienced it or because they've just gotten used to the level of technology and standard of living um that we live at today and yeah. i think that produces a lot of this this false nostalgia uh i i will say um that people should read the book uh and it's great it's called our own worst enemy uh the assault from within on modern democracy and also uh if you're an, if you're it's out in paper book and if you are a fan of of audiobooks it's read by you which is always nice when it's read by uh, i did read i did author. read the book that's uh, for people i like an, an audiobook uh and particularly when it's read by the author it's nice um so as we're parting just to go uh, uh since we do do have an affection for for local things here uh if someone makes it up to your part of Rhode Island uh and they are whether the past they're on their way to Boston whether they're going to spend a full week or weekend in Rhode Island and you got the chance to to play tour guide for a second and send them somewhere whether it's a restaurant or or, or park or museum or whatever where would you send them oh boy you know i, I that puts me at the risk of um you know, playing fev favorites with, with um, the restaurants and bars in my hometown. Um, what I would tell people is um, if they come up north to New England to um, try the real New England version of fried clams, because in other parts of the country, there are these chewy clam strip bits of nastiness. And, and someone pointed out, you have to get north of Stamford, Connecticut, before fried clams taste the way that New Englanders um, love them so much. So if you're coming through here, don't go to a fancy restaurant. I could I could give you recommendations for all kinds of fancy places, and they're all good restaurants. Go to the beaches here. We have great beaches here in Rhode Island, and go to the just go to the snack shacks and grab yourself a you know a, a thing of fried clams and. Um, the other delicacy that I will tell you that some people might like and some people might not like, Rhode Island has its own version of clam chowder. This is a little secret that people don't really know. Most people think of clam chowder as, you know, white and creamy and potatoes and all that stuff. Um, New York, Manhattan clam chowder is not clam chowder, by the way. It is tomato soup with some clams in it. So that's New Englanders don't even think of that as clam chowder. Rhode Island, however, has this kind of clam chowder that's clear. It's a clear broth with a little bit more spice because this area has a lot of, um, unlike the rest of New England, has a lot of Portuguese and Italian um, heritage here. So, you know, you get this kind of spicy, clear broth with potatoes and clams in it. So if you come to Rhode Island, give it a shot. You know, first have the fried clams. Make sure that you eat real New England fried clams with the bellies. Um, 
which you can't get really decently anywhere else in the country, and try Rhode Island clam chowder. They're very proud of it here. Uh, we're known for calamari, which I don't, I think is okay, but Rhode Island clam chowder is this weird thing that you can't find anywhere else. So if you come through this state, and by the way, you can pass through this state in about 45 minutes because we're tiny. Um, stop and get some Rhode Island clam chowder. Okay. Yeah, I, um, I'm the son of a man from Delaware, so uh, small states. Right. And, and, yeah. Uh, well, Tom Nichols, thank you so much for making time to be on this podcast. Uh, it was really, really fun uh, to chat with you. Uh, and and again, everyone should go read the book. And if uh, whether or not you go read the book, you should also uh, go over to the Atlantic and read Tom or subscribe to his Peacefield uh, newsletter, which is also great. Um, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks, Alan. It was fun. All right. Take care. The Periphery is a production of the Pulaski Institution. I've been your host, Alan Elrod. Our music was written, recorded, and produced by Brandon Ragsdale and Cody Smith. Thank you for coming, and please join us next time.